about today, David. Watson. We're talking today about Maggie Ulmer. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Plain Truth, a Holy Spirited podcast. I am Maggie Ulmer, and I am here in the studio of United Theological Seminary with David Watson. And Scott's not here. Scott couldn't make it today. I'm try- trying to manage y'all's schedules is... Uh, Challenging. Yeah. We're all very busy. I didn't used to be this busy, but then... I got very busy. Yeah. So I hardly even get to talk to you anymore. I know. I'm it's less you know, ministry life is busy. Well, today on the podcast oh, I want to talk about Maggie Ulmer. I want to hear about your spiritual journey, Maggie. I I want <laughs> I want to know I want to answer the question Who is Maggie Ulmer? <laughs> I, 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 I'm against this topic idea. <laughs> this is uh, this is what a real absence of content looks like. <laughs> mm, I don't think so, Maggie. I think our listeners want to hear about your spiritual journey. Let's start <laughs> early on. This is your life. Were you raised in the church? Um, yes and no. I did not start out right. Ra- my family is not super churched um but when i came to christ in junior high um then i asked if i could if we could our family could go to church or if i could go to church and my mother um understandably was like well i'm not going to just let this 13 year old pick whatever church she wants to go to so we ended up at a very nice united methodist church down the road from our house united christian parish Redeemer, UMC. Where was that? In Reston, Virginia. Okay. And what was your experience of that church? Well, um, I remember that church as being very warm and very familial. You know, it was a smaller church. The building is quite big now at this point. But um, I, I went to school with the daughter of the man who was the pastor there. She and I were in junior high and high school together. Um, sometimes in classes and stuff and it was a neighborhood church and yeah we had fun so you came to faith when you were 13 yeah and before that you would not call yourself a christian no i didn't even know what christianity was wow yeah so there was no upbringing in the faith prior to that time no not that i recall no you said before that um your father was not friendly to christianity (laughs) no he was not no he always called himself a humanist um and he but he was pretty i mean i love first let me preface this with i love my father and we had a very frank sort of relationship like we were very um uh honest with each other and i never had much of a filter and he never had much of a filter with me so we would just so it's genetic yes it's genetic well i would say i get it it's come by honestly on both sides Mm -hmm. but um so we would always talk after i came to christ we would talk about religion and you know he One might call him patronizing or condescending. Okay. But, no, he called himself a humanist, a secular humanist, and um, he would occasionally attend the local Unitarian Universalist church with my stepmother, who dabbled in and continues to, I think, in all kinds of New Agey kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, he thought it was cute. (laughs) He thought your Christianity was cute? Yeah, he did. That's what he said. So he he read a lot of philosophy. We we read a lot of the atheist you know, philosophers, little Nietzsche and high school and stuff together. I think he was just trying to steer me in the right direction. So after you became a Christian at age thirteen, um, how did your parents receive that? You said your mom decided to take you to church. Yeah, I think I think it, at least from what my mom told me <clears throat> later, she was 
expressed to me at, at later when I was an adult, we were talking about it, that it was a moment that brought her back to the church. Okay, good. And, and that was beautiful. And then, um, of course, there were, my sisters came to church on Sundays, and we all went to youth group. And, I mean, I can't speak for them. I know that they've had their own sort of journeys and whatever, but it was just always a very... It was an important place for me. You know, I, I've, I've um, felt at home in church. And in fact, when I was in junior high and my sort of friends very directly evangelized me. People say this all the time. You can't just tell people that Jesus is the son of God and that he died for your sins and then have people come to Christ. And I want to say, that's not true. That's what happened to me. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, she literally said those words. And, and and I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit sitting in the um, lunchroom of my junior high. And wow. Yeah. That must have been awkward. Well, I think I don't remember thinking anybody else noticed anything. So God is gracious that way. Okay. It wasn't like I fell out. It was more like. Really, everything in junior high is awkward. So but awkward. But having an encounter with the Holy Spirit in the lunchroom has to be. Next really? level. Yes, but let's just consider who I am for a minute. Is there any reason to think that I was anything less than horribly awkward? No. Yeah. Okay. So, um, from that point forward, you were a Christian. You went to church. Yeah. You know, you, but you were, you were raised in kind of the mainline liberal tradition. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, and did that. Uh, shape your theology for a time? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you were raised in that mainline liberal tradition, and you bought into the mainline liberal tradition. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you went in a different direction, right? Yeah. Now, what happened there? Well, I think there are two sort of like sort of tent poles I can sort of think of. I, I remember distinctly in high school having a moment where um, it occurred to me that I might not be holy. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, and just the concept of holiness and what it meant to be um, justified by God or, or sort of righteous according to God's definition of righteousness. The seed of that thought just got planted. And I, and I can't exactly remember where but I do remember asking my youth pastor um and of course I had already been baptized and this just tells you like how closely I did not I did not pay close attention during confirmation class so it's no I, I'm just gonna say it's no fault of of the people who led that but I remember asking him, is it okay that I'm baptized because I know that I sin? So like clearly not an understanding of baptism there. And his response to me, I love him to death. He, he was a, a very important person in my life. But his response to me was, ah, uh, yes. Are we clean enough to take a bath? That was his response. <laughs> oh, good. Good. And I was like, huh? So anyway, I, I had this, this thought that just got planted in my, I, my mind. Like, oh, how does sin work? How does how does holiness work and how does being forgiven for your sins work? Things like that. And I started to think about the difference between what I was seeing around me in culture versus what scripture said, but very low key, you know, like that was not stuff that I went to my peers and talked with. And then I got married many years later and, um, my husband had a more cons well he had a much more orthodox he was raised catholic he was raised roman catholic yeah. yeah he had a much more orthodox theology than i did okay and we began to argue about some things that uh, well arguments that lots of people in the umc right now may be familiar with some of these arguments because no way yeah way so he and i were having those arguments and, and we were not in agreement on them okay and I, he was taking the more sort of conservative position, and I was not. And and it was it was really 
hard there for a second. Although not hard in that, like my husband was like, all right, you can think whatever you want. I just know what I read in this book. I can't see Rob being jerky about it. No. He's, he's a good egg. He is a good egg. And also just incredibly patient with me. I mean, this is something that... He's a patient guy. He is a patient guy. He's also just, like, he's always taken the... You know what scripture says about husbands dying for their wives? He's always taken that very seriously. And so he took it very seriously that I um, had... I mean let's just call it what it was. It was an incorrect view of scriptural truth. And he took that very seriously. And he, he prayed for me, not with me because I would have, yeah, I would have hurt him. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Sure. Yeah. If he had been like, dear Lord, while I was sitting there, please help Maggie in all of her confusion. I would have murdered him. Sure. But no, I know later he, I pray that sometimes though. For me. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. I need it. Yeah. Please help Maggie in all of her confusion. <laughs> so yeah. true. Um, I really pray that about Scott more, really? honestly. So confused. He's not here. I feel like we're missing an opportunity. For like, what? I don't know. Just to say whatever we want. Like, he can't defend himself. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we can. We can say whatever we want. Scott has the best sweater no, collection I've ever seen. No, I don't think Scott is theologically confused on most things. No, he's not. He's theologically absolutely 100% certain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I admire it, honestly. All right, anyway. So, he yeah. has things worked out well. Yeah, he has things, things worked, worked out, out well. well. Yeah. You know. And I He's thought through a lot of things. Who? Scott. Scott? Yeah. Yes. So He may be a donatist and that's a problem. Oh but. my god. Anyway, let's move on. Let's not talk about Scott. We're talking about you. Oh, gosh. Nice try. Mm. Nice deflection. Well. So your husband and you were in disagreement. We were in disagreement about some particular theological issues. And, you know, uh, I forget how I eventually came to think differently, but it wasn't because I was argued into it. It was really, um, I mean, I, just like every other human being, tons of things have been written about this it's almost impossible to argue somebody into a different position of belief they have to have a revelation of something else being true and i did at some point i just realized oh god you are good and you are holy and though the way that i came to understand truth about god's holiness and you know sexuality and all whatever the other things that i was turning over in my mind was not because he said oh those things X, Y, Z is, is wrong is actually because I had a revelation of his goodness and his love. And I just realized the reason I'm trying to protect an incorrect way of seeing things is because I think it would be cruel to deny somebody who feels that way, thinks that way, believes that way, their viewpoint. And so what changed my viewpoint was a revelation of how truly good God is. That his goodness covers those things completely. Mm-hmm. And um, and actually, you know, being convicted of my own sin and realizing how much I have been forgiven and that I've not only held wrong views about what other people do, I've held wrong views about justifying what I do. And so, anyway, all that to say... Um, yeah, I God is very good, and He's been very gracious with me. And so, your husband was not a pastor when you met. No. What was he doing? <laughs> he was an actor. We were both actors. That was his profession, acting. Yeah. You must have been quite poor. <laughs> <laughs> I just say that about actors in general. I'm sure Rob is an excellent actor. He was. Oh, he could have gotten a lot more work than I got. That's for sure. Um, he was always, people were always trying to hire him. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I would. Yeah. If I were like a casting agent, I'd hire Rob. He's particularly good at playing certain types of characters, which I, want, I don't want to embarrass him, but he's got a certain kind of wired quality. So. He's got good hair. He does have good hair. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so we were both actors when we met and I knew he had a calling 
I didn't know what prophetic um, sort of impulses were. But he, just to back up for a second, so his job, like the job he went to work yeah. and earned money at was just being an actor. Yes. I didn't really know that was a thing, but okay. Well, what do you think Tom Hanks does? Well, yeah, but he's a movie star. Yeah. Right? So, like, I figured actors were always people who, like, acted when they could get gigs and were baristas the rest of the time or, you know, stock shelves at Aldi or something like that. Is that false? Probably not Aldi. I don't think they have a very flexible work schedule. Okay. Um, no. I mean, no, there's a version of that that exists for sure. Okay. That's why so many actors get jobs waiting tables or tending bar because they're flexible shifts. Okay. And you make a lot of cash on a shift. But and you were an actor too, a full time actor. So you were both full time actors. We were full time actors, and there are different types of acting jobs. And the type of acting job that we had at the time was much more stable. We worked for a children's theater company that toured regularly around the DC, Maryland, and Virginia. You were in a touring theater troupe? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you never heard this? <laughs> No. <laughs> were, were there flute players and jugglers? <laughs> I, I plead the fifth. <laughs> there, there were. Weren't there? there were Did you also... get together in, in, in the evenings? You're like, we're acting. No. I mean, I didn't. I had a child by then, so I went home yeah. to take care of my baby. But okay. I, um, there were also uh, puppets. <laughs> Oh God! This is this is Kafka esque in my mind. Such a scenario, right? A situation of nightmarish quality, a tangled web of horror. Oh, um, so you could have been an actor. You're good at memorizing things. No, I would get stage fright and forget my lines 100. percent That's not true. Anyway. Oh, I would get horrible stage. I couldn't be an actor. Did you ever do any soap opera work? You were Rob. Um, I don't know about Rob. I never did soap opera work, but I did do... Wait, have I told you this? Am I about to be trapped? No, you haven't told me. I don't want to say anything. Come on, Maggie. I... Well... I I did occasionally do some um, sort of video or television work, and one of the things I did in high school was like akin to like PBS after school special kind of thing. It's the kind of thing that back in my day, and by my day, I mean like in the 80s and 90s, when you were in school and the health portion of your phys ed class or whatever, like, and they want, you know, the teacher was like, okay, now we have to not do sports. We have to do something about, you know, um, drugs or saying no to drugs, whatever, narcotics prevention, blah, blah, blah. I was in something that dealt with the um, dangers of teen alcohol abuse. Is this available on YouTube? False. <laughs> That's, no. Okay. All right. <laughs> no. Are you sure? I'm, I haven't looked. If you can find this. It's not out there. I don't even remember what it's called. I used to have a VHS of it. What were your lines? Were they like, no, man, I don't want to use alcohol. That's not cool. Um, no. All I remember is that there was a scene where there was a car accident and one of our, there was a group of friends. There was a car accident in the video and, you know, I somehow, my character ended up on the scene of the accident for dramatic effect, of course. And I, mm -hmm. there was a scene where the sort of, the, I was the ingenue girl and the sort of the pseudo romantic friend lead was there. And he, he was like, don't look at me. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Tina, why did you drink that beer? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And okay. they had to like, they did like little video trick, you know, where they put a little like Vicks vapor rub under your eyes. So your eyes water. Listeners, please. I'm begging you. <laughs> I'm begging you. If this is on YouTube, please find it. I, you won't be able to find it. Okay, sure. So, moving on, um, okay. you and your husband are professional actors, yeah. which I'm still, this is amazing. <laughs> and 
I mean, I'm sure you were both excellent actors. That's not what's amazing. I just didn't know that acting, apart from movie stars, was a full-time job until now. Oh, yeah. And, okay, yeah. awesome. And then he got a call into ministry. Yeah, well, we got married, and he had sort of stopped. I think he, he stopped acting shortly after we got married. And I was still trying to make a run of it and doing various things. And um, we were going to church together, and the pastor who married us, I just remember saying to him, I think Rob has a call to ministry. And he just said, yeah, I think so, too. So we had a conversation about it before before Rob did. Wow. <laughs> and, and then he just shepherded Rob through that process. And we were in the UMC at the time, and um, that was back in the good old days in the early 2000s. And, you know, it was very, very sort of boring process back then. So, uh, you know. And when he told you then that he was going to go to seminary. Oh, yeah. I kind of had a bad reaction to that. You did? Yes. Well. Can you reenact it? <laughs> it went something like this. I'm not moving out of my condo to go live in some crappy seminary dorm. <laughs> and I moved out of my condo and moved into a crappy seminary dorm. Okay. So. I, I just didn't. Yeah, change has never been my forte. Okay. So that's why the Lord called my husband to be a United Methodist pastor. Because all you do is move. Yeah, right. So then you went to Wesley Seminary. Well, Rob went as a student, and I attended as a reluctant resident, yes. And how was that? Wesley Theological Seminary was a fascinating place. Scott Kisker was the history and doctrine teacher there professor and that's where we met the Kiskers and um, lived in DC for four years Rob took the long way to the end of his seminary degree okay and it was great but actually while we were there we began attending a charismatic Anglican church and that's actually where I was sort of first exposed to a church environment that openly um, discussed embraced acknowledged the move of the spirit which i had been having experiences for a long time since i was a child and i just never had any place to put them and my whole life growing up in the umc i you no know, i don't remember anyone talking about it and for a long time until i got married i was like maybe i'm doing it wrong hmm. like i used to feel like i knew things or you have a finely tuned spiritual antenna mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i i used to I used to mine is like a broken pair of rabbit ears that's on, not a, on a true. on a on a fuzzy screen TV. Yeah, that's not true. And I don't know if mine is finely tuned. I just know how it's always been for me. I think that there are people who hear more clearly than I do, for sure. And I've met them, and they scare me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you went to this Anglican church. Rob graduated seminary. Praise the Lord. Became appointed yeah and but at some point god's favor fell on you <laughs> and you moved to ohio god's favor that's right i actually had a word from the lord when we lived in dc that we were going to move to ohio and i remember telling rob maybe we should look at, at one of the conferences in ohio or i just called it the ohio conference i didn't know that there were two conferences mm -hmm. in ohio and nothing against ohio but sorry but rob was like why would we move to Ohio, Maggie? We're not moving to Ohio. And I was like, okay, sure. But we had two we had a neighbor, a couple, who were our neighbors in seminary who were part of the West Ohio Conference. And um, and the Kiskers had moved out here. Well, they didn't move out there until Rob had it, was at his first appointment. Oh, I see. So I, the first time I had heard about the West Ohio Conference was um, from – this couple that we live next door to who we had a lot of fun and um it was laura and rich bensman okay and uh we used to cook out laura's dad used to send her ground venison and we'd have deer burgers nice in the back back sort of lawn area of wesley anyway we had a good time with them and so I, every time i would talk with them i would just have this feeling like we're going to live in Ohio. And Rob would be like, no, we're not. We're not moving to Ohio. He got his first church in a 
lovely, wonderful place, Matthews, Virginia. And we love those people to death. Um, there were a few sort of struggles in his ordination process, which sometimes people encounter for a number of different reasons. And in my opinion, his struggles were through no fault of his own. And we decided to pursue the process in West Ohio, and the Lord just opened doors like boom, boom, boom for us to come here. And wow. Did, and it was awesome. And in the meantime, Scott Kisker had moved to Ohio with his lovely family, Roberta and the numerous Kisker children. Right. And every time he would call the house, because he and Rob were friends, the Lord would talk to me about United. Wow. Cool. And how you're going to go there someday. No, that's not what the Lord said, but we don't have to talk about that right now. <laughs> but that was the first time that I had experienced, like, uh, like the Lord talking to me about things that I have no natural knowledge of. Wow. Okay. But once you came to United, it feels like the charismatic aspect of your faith life ramped up a lot. Once I came to Ohio, yes. You said United. Oh, I did? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you hang around United people all the time. It's true. So it's true. You hang around me. You hang around Scott. You hang around Pete Bellini. I mean, when, Matt I, Reynolds. when I get a chance to hang around you guys, yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. When you deign to grace us Stop. with your presence. Anyway, where's Scott? Matt Reynolds, graduate. Tony Miltenberger, graduate. Yes, oh, those yeah. are Spirit and Truth staff. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, and uh, so what is it about Ohio that helped you to grow in the Spirit, in, in your understanding of spiritual gifts? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's Ohio. I mean, honestly, my husband, <laughs> Rob, was the one who first— you know, everybody takes those goofy, like, spiritual gift tests. Yeah. And um, I had taken one, and I had scored uh, very high in a couple areas where I was like, oh, I don't, this surprises me. I didn't, I have no, I don't have a context or frame of reference for these things. And and Rob is just very, um, you know, sort of even keeled about a lot of things, especially related to Scripture. And he said, well, you should just pray. Just, just pray, because Scripture says you should earnestly desire the gifts. And so you should earnestly desire them in prayer. And so I did. And then when we came to Ohio, yeah, we just met people who were, I mean, we knew the Kiskers, and they were obviously very spirit-filled, and we were coming from this Anglican church that was more charismatic. And then when Rob had his first appointment in Jackson Center, there was a Pentecostal church like down the road and he met with the lead pastor there every week. And I don't know, it was just sort of a, I, it felt very slow, but really I've only lived here for about seven years. So it was exponential. It was okay. sort of like somebody jammed on the gas pedal. And I, I did things like I went to the Holy Spirit seminar mm -hmm. when Kim Moss was speaking there. Yeah. Yeah. That was a very profound sort of experience. And uh, I went to the Awaken to Destiny conference with when Brandy that Clark. Was Global yeah. Awakening. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I think. And you started a Holy Spirited podcast that's with Scott true. and me. It's true. Yeah. And I got dragged onto this podcast. Yeah. And uh, and so I don't know. Those are. It was just. The You're Lord. welcome. By the way. <laughs> Thank you. I was about to thank you for introducing me to Global Awakening stuff because I had no idea who those people are. Mm, okay. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're cool. Love Global Awakening. Yeah. So, I don't know. This just seems like it would be the most boring interview ever. And then you came onto the staff of Spirit and Truth. That's true. I was a board member, which I did not want to be. I feel like you asked me a couple times, you should be on the board. And I was like, I don't want to be on any boards. They suck. Boards don't suck. Boards are important. Boards are important. But some boards suck. <laughs> well, the Spirit and Truth board has never sucked. Those people are awesome and amazing. Um, but I think I just, I did not think of myself as a person to be on a board. And then, um, and then um, you started, we started the Firebrand thing. Yes. That, and I started to help with that 
and then that was a part-time thing and then I sort of from there got drawn into full-time staff position at Spirit and Truth mm -hmm. and now I work with the Spirit and Truth staff and we travel around and talk about how to hear God and evangelism and discipleship and letting the Holy Spirit mess you up. Awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. So, takeaways. <laughs> takeaways. <laughs> <laughs> My takeaway is, listeners, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what advice do you have for young listeners who young are, listeners. Um, you know, just trying to grow in the gifts and want to know God more fully and just want to um, grow in their walk with Christ? Just, I mean, the, I don't have any new wisdom in that area. The same wisdom that has always been true is, is still true. Just read the word, pray, practice being in the presence of God, and mortify your flesh. That is very important, actually. And if there's anything that the Lord has been teaching me lately is to just endure uncomfortable things with graciousness and kindness and, and honor towards the people around you. And um, you want to grow in authority? Learn how to be unhappy with joy. I'm, I'm being so serious. Wait, what? Learn how to be unhappy with joy? I mean, un by unhappy, I mean, like, learn how to be uncomfortable and practice the joy of the Lord. Oh, I see. Learn how to be joyful in uncomfortable circumstances. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yes, that's a much better way of saying it. So if you can be humble and not, and I think we have a funny relationship with what humility really looks like we think oh it means to sort of demure and to not take on praise from people but you know there's there's nothing wrong with being congratulated for doing a good job at something like you know um like at Stillwater where we go to church um there are a ridiculous number of good musicians in that church yeah i mean it, there's a lot of talent there yes and there are a lot of good preachers and there are many brilliant people like we have multiple you're an academic we have multiple academics in in the um congregation just off the top of my head i can think of at least three or four um so there are a lot of gifted people and when those people perform well according to their God-given natural abilities and talents. There's nothing wrong with saying, wow, you're really good at that, you know? Humility, you know, is... We get the word humiliation from humility. It means to subvert your internal preferences. That's uncomfortable. And I have just been learning to do that to subvert my internal preferences, not just in a way that says, well, I'll just, I'll just let this other person pick what movie we see, or just for the record, I've never done that in my marriage, but so, AKA growing edges. Yeah. Um, but like to be in a situation where you disagree with what is, um, you know, you don't necessarily agree with everything that's being said or, or you feel like, it's, it's not the correct representation of something, but you see that there are good things happening and that God is at the center of what's happening. It's just not what you think should be happening. Um, There's a lot of that going on right now, Yeah, I think, in my life and your life. Mm -hmm. And I probably a lot of people's lives. And if you can practice the fruit of the Spirit, you know, and allow those things to happen and treat people with love and honor and to see what God sees in them, you will grow in spiritual authority. And <laughs> anyway, that's what the Lord has really been teaching me a lot about lately. And um, so it's, um, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah, it can be. Maggie, this has been a fascinating oh, conversation. Up. No, it hasn't. <laughs> I just feel like, um, please don't unsubscribe after this episode. <laughs> I want to thank you for your candor and your wit, your wisdom. <laughs> Shut up. 
Um, all right, that's been our podcast for today, you guys. And next time we'll be interviewing David Watson, where he will regale no, us with we're, we tales only, of growing up in Texas. We only got through part one of the no, interview. False. There are no Maggie, more. Maggie, you're talking about your growing edge as being happy in uncomfortable circumstances. This is one of those. I, I want to go now. <laughs> Anyway, that's been our podcast today. We thank you so much for listening. And like I said, please stay. Um, check us out on Twitter at Holy Spirit Pod. Rate and like the podcast. And normally I would say you should share this podcast, but you don't have to share this episode. Um, share it. <laughs> hey, and you guys, the Holy Spirit Seminar, which is hosted every year by United Theological Seminary, is coming up the first week of December. You should check it out. The guest is Carolyn Moore. You can head over to the website, United Theological Seminary's website, to register for the conference. I highly recommend you do so. I have been a number of years, and it's always been an amazing experience. Um, David's going to be there, and he's going to pray for you, and you're going to fall out in the spirit and get all the gifts. That's what he said. It's going to be so good. So good. So um, uh, if you come, you'll see me there, and you'll see a bunch of awesome people there. And um, all right, that's our show for today. So we'll come back to you next time. Bye. Bye.